guys welcome back everybody we're looking here at the epithelial membranes and the epithelial membranes are going to be like the cutaneous membranes and this is going to be the skin and if you remember what kind of epithelial covering do i have in the skin it's my keratinized stratified squamous epithelium Another type of membranes that will be also covered with epithelium will be the mucous membranes. And the mucous membranes are like the membranes lining your respiratory tract. And the mucous membrane lining the gastrointestinal tract. And can you remind me of the type of epithelial lining of those different parts of the gastrointestinal tract and the respiratory tract? So first we have the respiratory tract, we have the lining of the trachea bronchi and bronchioles do you have the lining of the oral cavity tongue and the pharynx along with the esophagus. We have the lining of the stomach, and the rest of the gastrointestinal tract. All right, so please mention the lining, epithelial lining of those different parts. So, oral cavity, pharynx, and esophagus. What is the epithelial lining? This is going to be question number four for today. For the lining of the rest of the gastrointestinal tract, like small intestine, stomach, large intestine. This is gonna be number five. For the lining of the trachea, this is gonna be number six. And for the lining of the small airways, this is going to be number seven. All right, so please answer those as part of your in-class activities for today. I'll give you a minute to recall the types of epithelium here in, the, in those mucous membranes. What do you think? What was the lining of the oral cavity covering of the tongue, pharynx, and the esophagus? Can you remind me, please? Can respond in the chatting box. Number four. 
stratified squamous. Yes, you're missing something. You're missing something, part of it. What what kind of stratified squamous is it? Remember how many types of keratin of stratified squamous do we have? We have either keratinized or non-keratinized. So which one was it here? Non-keratinized stratified squamous CPT. Non-keratinized stratified squamous CPT. This is gonna be the answer for number four. How about the uh, lining of the gastrointestinal tract from stomach to the anus, inner canal? What do you think? It was releasing mucus, enzymes, allowing absorption. What kind of epithelium did we have in this part? And remember, try to be as specific as possible. What kind of epithelium did we have lining those parts? Give you a second. Simple columnar non cdated Simple columnar non cdated Simple columnar non cdated This is going to be the type of epithelial lining of the stomach to the anus of the gastrointestinal tract, except for oral cavity pharynx and esophagus. How about number six? What was the type of epithelial lining of the trachea. Epithelial lining of the trachea, can you remind me? Pseudo, exactly, pseudo stratified. Columbar, cediated. APT, so the certified columnar cediated APT. How about number seven? Can you remind me? Can you remind me what was the lining of the small airways? Simple squamous was in the air sacs, not the airways. Remember, you perform the exchange. So you're gonna need to have what is the minimum resistance. This was the lining of the air sacs, not the airways. Airways are gonna be conducting to the air sacs. Air sacs are, are lined with simple squamous epithelium, but what was the lining of those small bronchi, which are branches from the tree? Any idea? Anybody did get an answer here? Remember, this was a simple columnar ciliated epithelium. Simple columnar cediated epithelium. So look at on here. Number four, the lining of the oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus. This was again non keratinized. Stratified squamous epithelium. How about number five again? This was non cediated. Simple columnar epithelium. Any trouble? Any trouble with this 
part. Moving on to another type of membranes. This is gonna be my serous membranes. And what are serous membranes? Those are double layered membranes that will be surrounding the different organs. Each serous membrane gonna have one layer. If for example, we're looking at the heart, this is my heart like this. It's gonna be surrounded by a serous membrane, a layer that would be firmly attached to the wall of the heart from outside. And the other layer is gonna be lining the cavity where it's kept in. So any serous membrane that we have is gonna have two layers, a layer covering the organ and the layer lining the cavity. So the layer covering the organ on here is what we call my visceral layer. And the layer lining the cavity is this gonna be my parietal layer. So again, again, any serous membrane gonna have two layers. One is visceral, it's attaching, it's attached to the wall of the organ, and one is parietal, so it would be lining the cavity. And we have three major examples here of serous membranes. So we have the ones that would be surrounding the heart. This is my pericardium. Peri, peri means around, and cardia, cardia is heart. So you've got two layers. One that would be attached to the outside of the heart. This is my visceral pericardium. And one layer that would be lining the cavity where the heart is located is going to be my parietal pericardium. Same concept for the lungs. We've got a, a serous membrane around the lungs, and this is going to be my here pleura. So you've got a layer of the pleura that is covering the lungs and another layer of the pleura that would be lining the thoracic cavity. So we call the one covering the lung is my visceral pleura. And the one lining the thoracic cavity from inside is gonna be my parietal pleura. Also, we've got another famous serous membranes that we have this time in the abdominal cavity. And this is gonna be my peritoneum. Again, I have two layers, right, lining the abdominal cavity from inside and visceral covering the abdominal organs from outside. So those are gonna be the two layers of my peritoneum. So I've got right and peritoneum and visceral peritoneum. So what happens to the tissue when it gets injured? So if I got injured, first I fill the injured site with blood, forming a blood clot. And also I would be releasing inflammatory chemicals that would cause the dilation of the vessels bringing more blood at the injured site. This will also increase the vessel permeability. And you see on here, in the first stage of after the injury of the tissue, I will be able to form a blood clot. In the second step of the repair of an injured tissue, I will have organization and restoration of the blood supply. So the blood clot will start to be broken down and gets replaced by fibrous tissue, granulation tissue. The epithelium will start to regenerate to cover this injured side from outside. And the fibroblasts will be producing the collagen fibers to 
bridge the gap of the injured site, as you see on here. So first step is inflammation. You did dilate the vessels. You did bring more blood at the injured site. You started to replace the blood clot with granulation tissue, fibrous tissue. And you see on here, those are the fibroblasts are building up their fibers, the collagen fibers, trying to seal this gap in the injured at the injured site. This injured site you see on here also was covered by the epithelium that is gonna be replicating from both sides. So this is how it looked like when I first formed the blood clot. Those living epithelial cells would be proliferating to cover this injured site from both sides, as you see on here. The third step is going to be the regeneration and the breakdown of the fibers. The remaining part of the blood clot on the outside, the scap, is going to detach. Fibrous tissue will become mature and the epithelium will become thicker. So it's going to be building up multiple layers to return back to its normal shape. This results in a fully regenerated epithelium, but the inside is still going to be fibrous tissue. So it's still going to be scar tissue below this epithelium. So you see on here, the epithelium is, has fully regenerated. No problem with that. But this unit still remain a scar tissue. This will bring a question. In what circumstances? <laughs> In what circumstances would I have a scar on the skin? What do you think? What will make an injury leave a scar, a mark? And what makes another one doesn't make a scar? And both are injuries. So what will be the difference in here between those two? The difference is whether you have covered the scar tissue with epithelium or not. So for example, if it was a large injury, and a smaller injury like this. Which one do you think is more likely to leave a scar? A large injury or a small injury? A large one, why? Because simply the formation of scar tissue here is going to be faster than the ability of the epithelium to regenerate, to cover this whole gap. So what I will end up with, I will end up having scar tissue bulging out like this. And this is how st stitching the two sides of an injured side together will reduce the scar formation. All right.
Why? Because when I bring those two sides towards one another, I reduce the gap between the two sides, giving a chance for the epithelium to regenerate faster than the scar formation. Because if I was exposed to this large gap, the scar formation is going to be faster than the proliferation of the epithelial cells to cover this scar tissue. All right. Any questions? Any questions? All right, so let's go back to the glandular epithelium. This will be the last topic in this chapter. You remember glandular epithelium is a type of epithelium that builds up the glands. And we have two types of glands, either endocrine glands, and those are ductless glands, clusters of cells like this, that would be releasing their secretions directly in the bloodstream. And remember, those secretions are chemical messages that we call hormones. I have another type of glands. Those are the exocrine gland, exocrine gland, and those are gonna be producing their secretions to travel through ducts into the lumen. Like for example, the mammary glands. Mammary glands are going to be producing the milk through a duct for it to be ejected out. So the glandular cells might be unicellular, means the gland is formed of a single cell that might be embedded in between the epithelium, like the mucus secreting cell or the goblet cells that we have seen located in the simple columnar epithelium and the pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Here in this chapter, we're concerned only with the exocrine glands, the glands with dots. How do we classify those glands with ducts? We classify them according first to the duct and second according to the shape of the glandular portion, the secretory region in the gland. All right, so if I have a single duct This is going to be a simple gland. If I have multiple ducts that will fuse together, this is going to be a compound gland. According to the secretory region, it might have a rounded shape like this. All right, this is more of a tubular, all right, so see on here. This is more elongated here. Compared to this one, it's rounded. So if the shape of the secretory region is elongated here, like this, it's going to be classified as being tubular elongated, tubular. Another factor is whether I'm attached to one secretory region or multiple secretory regions. So if I'm looking on here, if I am connected to multiple secretory regions, this is going to be classified as branched. So again, again, three factors here that we use to classify those exocrine glands. First, according to 
the number of ducks. So one duct is going to be simple. Multiple ducts is going to be compound. So one duct is simple. Multiple ducts going to be compound. According to the shape of the secretory region, again, elongated is going to be tubular. Elongated is tubular. Elongated is going to be tubular. Rounded is going to be alveolar. Rounded here, alveolar. Rounded, alveolar. But if some of them are rounded and some of them are elongated, so we're going to call this as tubulo alveolar. Tubulo alveolar. If some of them are elongated, some of them are round. Another factor that we see here is going to be according to whether the duct is connected to multiple secretory regions or one secretory region. If one secretory region, you don't need to mention it. If multiple secretory regions that I am connected to, like in here, it's gonna be branched. Here, I have multiple secretory regions, it's gonna be branched. So how about this one? What do we classify as this one? I have one duct, so it's gonna be simple. And the secretory region is tubular, so it's gonna be what kind of gland? It's a simple tubular gland. Those are like the intestinal glands. Look in here. I have one duct, so it's going to be simple. And this duct is connected to multiple secretory regions, so it's going to be branched. And those secretory regions are elongated, so they are tubular. So we're going to call this as a simple branched tubular gland. And those are like the stomach or gastric glands. Look around here, I have multiple ducts, so it's going to be compound. What is the shape of the secretory region I'm connected to? It's elongated, so it's going to be compound tubular gland. And those are like the duodenal glands of the small intestine. So the duodenum is the most proximal region that is directly connected to the stomach. It's a C-shaped portion of the small intestine. If this is my stomach in here, this is going to be my duodenum. All right, so the, du the duodenum is going to have compound tubular glands. Look around here, I have one duct, simple. The secretory region is going to be rounded, so it's going to be simple alveolar gland. And we don't have an important example in humans of this type. I have one duct that is connected to multiple secretory regions. So it's simple. As one duct, simple, and multiple secretory regions on here. This will let me classify this as branched, and the shape of the secretory regions of the gland, it's going to be alveolar because it's rounded. So, what kind of gland do I, am I looking at in here? It's a simple branched alveolar gland, simple branched alveolar gland. Look around here, I have multiple ducts, so it's going to be compound. And the shape of the secretory regions of this gland is going to be rounded, so it's a compound 
alveolar glands. Those are like the mammary glands of the breast. Maybe on here, I have some rounded, some tubular. Some rounded, some tubular. And I have multiple ducts. So what do we call this? It's a tubular, it's a, it's a compound tubular alveolar gland. And the example here is going to be the salivary glands in your or, or connected to your oral cavity. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? All right, so this completes our discussion of chapter four. So please take the time to start working on your visible body assignment for the for the tissues and you can now go ahead and complete the chapter four quiz and this will help you reinforce the your knowledge a good source again to practice before you take the actual quiz for chapter four and any other chapter quizzes is gonna be your Q banks. This will help you identify if you have anything that you did not understand or that you need to study more, spend more time on. And if we go also to the canvas page, your course canvas page. You will see under module one, you've got those Q banks of the four first four chapters, as well as the PowerPoint presentations of the first four chapters. Something also that you might be interested in looking at is going to be the tissues sample questions, and this will give you the chance to get yourself familiar with how the questions gonna look like on your actual lab exam. So you will be asked to identify the type of tissue as you see on here. You will be asked to state the location. You are gonna be also identifying different structures on the on on the dish all right so we're looking here at the tissue sample questions and this will give you an idea about how the questions on the actual lab exam going to be addressed so it's very important to practice test yourself using those questions on under again you go here we go to lab exam preview documents, tissue sample questions, uh, tissue sample questions. Those are how the question is going to be addressed in your lab exam. All right. Yes, today we did have seven questions. Yes.
this was the last thing that we've got here. Seven questions. Any question for me today? Any question for me? Is this completes our discussion for today? Uh, anybody has any questions before we leave? All right, great, great. So thank you so much for making it to the meeting today. Sorry for being late. I did have a difficulty getting access to a, a good internet connection. So can, Brendan, can you please wait until the end to discuss with me? uh your concern because i'm not sure if i received your message all right for the rest of you uh yes please uh please type your first and last name in the chatting box and you're gonna be good to go All right, thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day.